Welcome to Bible Study with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. We provide a weekly online discussion of scripture, and then we continue that discussion in a responsive in-person way on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. in our church library. So this week's video will have a follow-up lesson and discussion this coming Sunday, September 8th, 2024. As we turn to our reading, please first join me in prayer. Creator God, we are grateful that the Bible is dynamic, that there are words of history, words of praise, words of lament, words of prophecy, that there are stories and parables, that there are visions and dreams. We are also grateful that there are songs and poetry. As we open scripture today and hear words that are different than the majority of scripture, May we open our hearts and minds to a better understanding of what you are saying to us today through the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. We spent much of this summer discussing first King Saul and the transition to King David, and then King David's reign and the transition from King David to King Solomon, and then some of Solomon's teachings, for instance, in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, as the wisdom of Solomon is shared, as he learned from his temptation and falling into sin. And now we're going to read a portion of the book of scripture known as the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, depending on your translation. So Song of Solomon, again, attributed to King Solomon, or at least the time of his reign, it's a poetic book that could also be presented as a song. It is a little bit difficult to read because it's offered up in different voices. So when you read it on the page, it's often easier than to listen to it. So I encourage you to open your Bible to Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, however it's titled, chapter one, and maybe read it once or twice again after I go over it today. And hopefully your Bible provides the headings of which is the female voice, the male voice, and what's sometimes referred to as the choral voice or chorus or the friends. So this goes back and forth almost verse by verse between a female speaking to her male lover, the male responding to his female lover, and friends or a chorus or like onlookers interjecting their comments. So it can kind of be difficult to understand not knowing that context or the switching back and forth of who the speaker and the listener are. We, of course, are kind of a th another kind of outside party observing or eavesdropping on this interaction, which is basically a love story. So here are these words from Song of Songs, chapter one. Solomon's Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. How right! They are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Keter, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Tell me, you whom I love where you graze your flock and where you rest the sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? If you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with a string of jewels. We will make your earrings of gold studded with silver. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. 
My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyard of En Gedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful, your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming, and our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. Now, most people read this book and go, why is that in the Bible? There's nothing wrong with it. It's a love poem or a love song. It's a back and forth between a man and a woman describing each other and saying what the things are they like about them. It's kind of an embellishment of a Hallmark Valentine's card. Some people kind of blush reading it because it has words in it like breast. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How scandalous. But it's a love poem. Your eyes are like doves. Your fragrance is pleasing. I want to be with you. I long for you. Where will you be on your lunch break with your flock so I can visit you? It's a back and forth love story with the occasional statement from kind of onlookers or supporters encouraging this couple that's in love. It's most likely that the king referred to in this poetry is King Solomon, but that he's not the lover. It's a young couple who are speaking to each other and one of their form of compliments is to be like, you are like the king. It's as if a young couple today were to say, the woman to the man, you are like Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt. And then he said to her, well, you are like you know, Jennifer Aniston or Angelina Jolie or some other famous, beautiful, well-known celebrity. They're complimenting each other by saying you are like the greatest, most well-known person of our time. They're also complimenting each other's physical appearance. They're saying that their physical appearance is similar to things in the agricultural world that they were used to. Flocks of sheep, verdant or green vibrant grass, doves, things that are luscious and healthy and growing to show that they are doing so in a way that is pleasing to those around them. There's also comments about the woman's skin, how it's darker because she's a hard worker, how she has been maybe unjustly put to work by her brothers to work outside in the vineyard, so she has darker, sun-soaked skin, but her lover still appreciates her, even though she maybe isn't traditionally beautiful, like someone who's stayed inside, reclining, being beautiful. She's been out working hard in the field. So all of this is true of this poem, but still, why is it in Scripture? Why of the 66 books of the Bible was this included? Why has it come along in Genesis, the story of the very origins of humanity? Alongside Exodus and Deuteronomy, the story of God's people learning what it is to be the chosen people of God. Why is it here alongside the four Gospels, the story of Jesus Christ sharing his parables and teaching with the world? Why is it alongside books of prophecy and books of vision, books of the history of our people? Well, because in the documents created during the time of King Solomon, this was one of the many resources for the faith of the people. It was understood that their communal life and their individual lives, their religious identity, their community identity, the justice and wisdom of the king were all intertwined, not to be compartmentalized or siloed as separate elements, but that life was integrated. So your legal life, the justice system, the governance of your people was just as important as your religious life, your spiritual identity, your devotion and righteousness before God, which was just as important as your worship life and like singing the Psalms, in the education upbringing in the next generation to do better than you, like the Proverbs or Ecclesiastes teach, and that your love life, your relationship with your beloved was not something to be hidden or something scandalous. It was something to be equally celebrated as a gift of life from God alongside the justice system, the legal system, the religious system, the institutional life, the governance, everything in your day-to-day -day life. We today, in our modern sensibilities, for whatever reason, have put romantic dialogue kind of on a shelf that's taboo. 
we have said public displays of affection are inappropriate or interactions and intimacy have to be R-rated or set aside from the public view. At this point, this is actually a rather tame exposition of a love story. But even in and of itself, across history and different times in the life of the church and the greater religious community, this portion of scripture has been censored. There was a time when priests would glue these pages of the Bible together so people in the pews could not open them because they were considered so scandalous. It's a heterosexual romantic love story. By the standards of 2024, it is very tame. Yet we understand that across generation, time, place, culture, and context, the sensibilities of each group of people who read this have been different. They're reading it through a different lens. I appreciate that this is in scripture because it reminds us of how different each culture who encounters the Bible is. A child reading this reads it very different than an 80-year-old. A married, heterosexual, monogamous man reads this different than a 30-year-old, abused lesbian reads it. Someone who's been married and divorced reads it differently than someone who's been widowed. Someone who's never been married reads it differently than someone who's celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Just like every part of scripture, the narratives, the histories, the worship, the visions, the prophecy, the dreams, the narratives that are just kind of direct, almost like a newspaper article, and the ones that are delivered more like a parable or a fable, all of these literary ways of sharing the story of the people of God are interpreted through the lens we read them, our own context. Some stories are more triggering than others. Some stories kind of poke us in the soft part of our lives. Some are affirming. A story that I read in scripture might have great deep meaning for me, and someone else might flippantly read it and discard it as useless, and vice versa. So Song of Songs or Song of Solomon is one resource in the richness of scripture that if and when we read it, will hit our mind, our ears, our soul, and our heart differently based on where we are in our life's journey. But it's valuable. And the Holy Spirit inspired generations to keep it in scripture because there's value in this love story. Some in the modern Christian church have even equated it as a lesson of Christ in the church, how Christ refers to the church as his bride, and how could the love story of Song of Solomon be applied, maybe, to Jesus' love for the church with a capital C? Whether or not that was the original intent, it is one way of interpreting it in the modern world. I would encourage you to read the entirety of this book if you have you know, 20 to 30 minutes to sit down and do that. It's probably one of the least familiar passages of scripture to you or even to me. I know it very well because when I was in seminary and I graduated and I had to take my ordination exams to become a pastor, one of those exams was in the Hebrew language and exegesis, which is pulling out of the text its meaning. And I was assigned a passage from Song of Songs. <laughs> they tend to give students obscure passages to prove that you know what you're doing rather than more familiar ones. And it was certainly a challenge for me. Thank you for enjoying this video and discussion with me. I would encourage you, if you're able, to join us in person this coming Sunday, September 8th, as we gather at 9.30 a.m. in our church library to further the discussion. We also worship in person at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday at the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, and we record those worship services for later online broadcast. You can find all of our online video resources if you search for the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church on YouTube or Facebook, or visit our church website, eppchurch.org. Thank you for joining us for this study, and I hope you will continue to worship and study with our congregation. Thank you.